But let me go to another disease entity where I believe speckled tracking can definitely add something, and that is the question of microregurgitation. Where would you use it in this setting, and where will it go? Well, this is an interesting new frontier for strain, this whole concept of its use in valvular heart disease. And in patients with mitral regurgitation, the burden chamber is the left ventricle. And we know in terms of guidelines, indications for intervention in patients with mitral regurgitation, it's a reduction in function. Here they're talking about reduction in ejection fraction. It is, it, is it not intriguing to think that subclinical changes in ventricular function, such as a reduction in global longitudinal strain in patients with chronic mitral regurgitation, may now be an indication for earlier intervention? And that thinking's not so far off because if we look at the most recent updated guidelines for the treatment of valvular heart disease from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology, they now give a class 2A indica indication for valve intervention as a progressive decline in ventricular function, but here we're only looking at ejection fraction, so it may have declined but not reached that threshold of 60%, or a progressive increase in chamber dimension, so it may not have reached the threshold, at least in the American guidelines of 40 millimeters. I know in the new European guidelines, it is 45 millimeters. Wouldn't it be interesting, Tommy and Fabian, if now we looked at global longitudinal strain and the global longitudinal strain started to decrease? And what that value is, I don't know, but it's interesting that in the cardio-oncology spheres, we're looking at relative changes of about 15%. Maybe that'd be an interesting cut point to consider earlier surgical intervention in these patients. I think a very good concept given the fact that, in essence, when we have a patient with a mitral regurgitation, we know that the afterload is reduced. And so we are expecting a hyperdynamic ventricle. But the question that I always have is how much hyperdynamic? Because we have to, of course, relate that to the degree of mitral regurgitation. Some patients might have severe, but others might have severe, severe. And these patients should actually have an ejection fraction maybe of 70%. So the cutoff value is here very difficult to determine. And I would also personally assume that it's the same with strain. So it's probably not the absolute value that might play a role uh, so I completely agree with you, but it's this progression of strain that might play a role. Uh, do you perform uh, serial measurements in patients with mitral regurgitation in your clinic? Yes, definitely. We try to do a strain analysis at every examination that we do. Even in case the patient is only there for a transesophageal echocardiography, we try to get the epical views from transthoracic as well to analyze global strain. So again, a very important target. But how does mitral regurgitation differ from aortic regurgitation? Of course, we have the same situation there. We're looking for the optimal time point when we should operate on these patients. Is the hemodynamics different and should we expect a different strain? In my experience, strain changes take place earlier in severe mitral regurgitation due to the volume overload of the left ventricle. And um, I think it's also different concept to, or an interesting concept to use strain analysis in patients with mitral regurgitation. I also don't have a clear cut point when should we start operating the aortic valve, but I think in future we might have some cut points that we can incorporate in recommendations for, mitral valve, for aortic valve surgery. Steve, how do you see this? I see it this way. You know, aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation are similar only in that they share the word regurgitation because the hemodynamic influence are very different. With mitral regurgitation, it's predominantly a volume load. And with aortic regurgitation, it's both a volume and pressure load because all that extra regurgitant volume has to be ejected now, not into the low pressure left atrium, but into the higher pressure aorta. So it's a very different hemodynamic state. And the relative changes potentially in strain, and it's intellectually intriguing to use this, may be different and a much higher threshold than with mitral regurgitation why? Because with mitral regurgitation, we're predominantly talking about valve repair. And with aortic regurgitation, it's really one of valve replacement. So I think it will have a different implications currently because we don't do much aortic valve repair. And so we would be trading one disease with another, meaning the aortic regurgitation now with prosthetic heart valve disease, where with MR, it's a totally different story. I would like to add to this discussion one point. In mitral regurgitation, more frequently, we find patients with atrial fibrillation. And this state, in my experience, makes speckle tracking analysis sometimes more difficult. So I think in AR, more consistently, we can measure global strain, but in mitral regurgitation, we are sometimes limited by patients with atrial fibrillation. So I guess you can appreciate 
that even though there are many open questions, speckle tracking can really make a difference.